Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Swapnil Joglekar. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. After being persuaded by the Swiss authorities, UBS Group AG will pay over $3.2 billion to buy its troubled rival Credit Suisse Group AG. The rescue deal, which is backed by a significant Swiss guarantee and expected to close by end 2023, will see UBS absorb up to $5.4 billion in losses. The deal is part of a broader effort to avoid further turmoil in the global banking system, which started with the collapse of two regional US banks earlier in March. The US will be making a coordinated effort to stop the banking crisis from spreading globally. So will Indian banks be affected by this turmoil? Bashar Kumar brings you the answer. By March 19th, a modicum of calm was restored in the global banking system. But this was thanks only to global central banks and other strong lenders pumping in significant sums of emergency cash. According to a CNN report, the rescue has cost close to $200 billion so far in direct central bank support. Here's the breakdown of the numbers. Guaranteeing all deposits at the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank could cost the US Fed $140 billion. Meanwhile, the Swiss National Bank has offered Credit Suisse $54 billion in the form of an emergency loan. The report says that banks have also borrowed over $150 billion from the US Fed in recent days, beating the previous $112 billion record set during the 2008 crisis by a considerable margin. Overall, the $318 billion the US Fed has loaned to the broader financial system is almost half the sum that was extended during the global financial crisis. The current crisis began on March 10th, when the biggest failure of a US bank since the global financial crisis came to the fore with US regulators taking control of California-based Silicon Valley Bank. SVB's collapse was the consequence of the US Fed rapidly increasing interest rates. They also shut down a second US regional bank, the New York-based Signature Bank, on March 12. Meanwhile, a third, the First Republic Bank, had to be propped up through a private sector rescue. But the crisis deepened on March 15th when Swiss authorities announced a backstop for Credit Suisse, which is among the 30 financial institutions known as globally systemically important banks, after watching its shares collapse by as much as 30%. The situation at Credit Suisse turned critical when a key shareholder refused to provide additional support through the infusion of capital. Finally, on March 19th, an emergency rescue deal was hammered out, with Switzerland's UBS agreeing to buy Credit Suisse. Closer home, Economic Affairs Secretary Ajay State told the Financial Daily that the crisis at Credit Suisse, along with the collapse of two American lenders, was unlikely to impact India's banking system or its broader macroeconomic stability, while stating that the present situation was nowhere near the level of the 2008 crisis, State cautioned that global capital flows could be adversely affected if the crisis became more pronounced. He said that the government, the Reserve Bank of India and SEBI were monitoring any potential spillover. A recent report by Jeffries India also indicated that India's banking system is expected to remain unaffected by the troubles at Credit Suisse because the Swiss lender has a very small presence in the country. But what do experts think? Will the Credit Suisse crisis and the turmoil in the broader sector affect the Indian banking system? All the three banks are unique cases as far as Indian banks are concerned. I think we are reasonably well capitalized. Our, um, um, you know, the if you see the look at the health of the bank, is it's pretty resilient. The provision coverage ratio is pretty good of all the banks on the very high side. And if you see that the last one year, every quarter is a better quarter for the banks than the previous quarter. So uh, in terms of uh, in terms of quality of credit, in terms of interest income, everything. So I think uh, we should not have any exaggerated fear about the entire banking system. It's fairly resilient, 
fairly robust and it has nothing to do with what we have seen in US and Europe in the past one week. To my mind, I thought the Indian banking is, is, is a very layered banking. The regulator has actually paid much more attention in uh, sort of risk management rather than the banking companies themselves. To the extent that if you look at the regulations, there are several layers and it's very difficult really for a bank really to, like for example in credit suisse, to get away without disclosing you know, any material impairment that may have happened to its valuation. So to that extent, I mean, I would say the Indian regulator has really worked out very well you know, in terms of putting a lot of caution around. Second is the size itself. No Indian bank will ever carry, you know, because the regulations do not allow them to carry a particular exposure. I mean, there are, I mean, it is to be diversified exposure, which means there are prudential, I mean, there are prudential norms associated with, or, 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 you know, I mean, conservative norms associated with exposures in any given sector, in any given company. So all that is already established. So to that extent, I mean, I would certainly say that uh, the spillover to the Indian banking may not be there. The Indian banking system is likely to prove resilient in the face of the current global crisis. However, continued caution and vigilance on the part of the government and regulators is warranted. Both investors and experts believe that even after UBS Group's takeover of Credit Suisse and the announcement of new dollar liquidity measures from central banks, the turmoil in the global financial system still has room to run. One of India's largest real estate developers sold almost a billion dollars worth of flats in a span of three days. These flats were part of a residential project in Gurugram. This comes at a time when home buying affordability measures declined in 2022. So what does real estate tell us about the Indian economy? Here's the Shah Vermas report. DLF, one of India's largest real estate developers, has sold luxury flats worth $970 million in Gurugram in just three days. This development comes at a time when 9 out of 10 ultra-high net worth individuals have seen an increase in their wealth, with real estate being one of the top investment areas, according to a Knight Frank report in January this year. The quick sale of luxury flats may be a reflection of increasing purchasing power of higher income groups in India. This comes at a time when experts say that India is going through a K-shaped recovery. Inflation has particularly impacted lower income households in India and reduced their consumption. Moreover, the home buying affordability, which is the ratio of monthly repayment on loans to total income, has declined in 2022. According to research by Anarok, the share of affordable homes in the overall housing market has dropped from 40% in 2018 to just 20% in 2022. So, is the sale of luxury homes also a reflection of K-shaped recovery? If you look at other industries, be it uh, automobile or, or high-end white goods, the top segment has kind of performed well compared to the bottom one. We also need to note the fact that post-COVID, while, you know, middle class and upper middle class saw their income level reach pre-COVID, it's, it's the bottom of the pyramid that is still struggling. And that's the reason we have seen, uh, uh, you know, an impact on the affordable housing segment. The share of luxury, we define luxury, which is 2.5 CR and above, almost doubled from, you know, 3% to 6%. So this, this clearly indicates that there is some disparity where, you know, the top segment has been doing quite well. After the sale of flats, DLF released a statement saying that more than 95% of the buyers at the Gurugram property were individuals who intend to live in the flats. So, are all such property sales buyer-driven or are they also speculation-driven? In terms of the contribution of the different variety of buyers, what we've seen in the last uh, two to three years uh, when these sales momentum continued to improve is largely it has been driven by end users in, in the last five to six months what we've also seen is other asset classes whether it is equity 
uh, that and so on have also been under some you know pressure in terms of their performance which may uh, you know uh, you know influence some investors to consider residential property as it has come out as a very good alternative to hedge against the inflationary scenario but like i said largely it's driven by end users in its report anarox cited high land costs and limited financing options as obstacles for the falling demand of affordable homes the increasing demand for premium real estate is in line with the growing demand for high end products and services across sectors the same however is not true for low end products and services experts suggest that lower growth in demand for affordable housing may be because of high interest rates amid rising inflation so what does this tell us about the state of affordable housing in india affordable housing definitely is is the need of the r and government has been very focused through its pradhan mantri awas yojana but unfortunately during covid uh, you know the uh, unorganized sector was impacted the most and they are yet to recover fully from the blow of covid and also what we have seen because of increase in input cost the margins of the developer who were you know uh, rolling out uh, your affordable projects have also come under pressure and and you know we also need to understand that buying a house is is basically a buyer basically bets on the uh, uh, future cash flow if he is not very certain about his future income he would defer his buying decision and that's what is happening at the uh, lower strata of the buyers although the purchasing power of high income groups has largely remained insulated from rising inflation and interest rates experts say that this may not continue if the negative trends stay A Reuters poll showed that a majority of the real estate experts believe that home ownership will rise in the coming years. This is primarily because India has always been an economy where purchase is preferred over renting. Amid these developments, the concerns will continue to loom over affordable housing. It remains to be seen if and how the affordable housing market increases in the future. UBS's buyout of troubled Credit Suisse seems to have calmed investors as nerves. As they now focus on the outcome of the two-day U.S. Fed meet on rates, Business Standards' Puneet Wadhwa caught up with Harsh Upadhyay, President and CIO Equity, Kotak Mahindra Asset Management, on his interpretation of the developments and whether it is a good time to start buying stocks from a long-term perspective. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Puneet Wadhwa. Today we have with us Harsha Padhyay, President and CIO for Equity at Kotak Mahindra Asset Management. Welcome to the show, Harsha. Uh, Thank you, Puneet. So, uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, do you think the regulators have been successful in uh, averting a global financial crisis uh, after the collapse of select banking giants in the US and in Europe? Uh, at least for now, while uh, the overall uh, uh, outlook still uh, looks looks a bit challenging, it seems like uh, uh, they have acted very swiftly, and we have seen what has happened to SVB, for example. It was contained uh, quite nicely within a couple of days. Uh, there has been a management control change as well. So, to that extent, uh, uh, we believe that uh, some of these issues are uh, well contained at this point of time. We'll have to obviously. uh cannot rule out more volatility given that uh, things are still fragile and and uh, and we need to monitor that okay okay so how do you think the global central banks will approach the monetary policies in the next few uh, months um have the discussions on quantitative easing come back to the table yet according to you uh, it's a little premature to talk about change in uh, monetary policies according to us uh, because finally the monetary policies are also driven by what happens to inflation and inflation across the board across the globe has been at higher levels or much higher than what the comfortable levels are for respective central banks so to that extent uh, 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 we may not see a reversal in terms of the monetary policies but yes maybe the the uh, sharp and frequent interest rate hikes that we were seeing in the past as it is were anyways expected to uh, slow down a bit given that we have already seen a uh, quite a bit of frequent uh, interest rate changes but given what has happened in the recent past maybe there will be some rethink in terms of the pace of interest rate hikes but one can't say that uh, monetary policies will get reversed uh, anytime soon uh, overall i think uh, the, the central banks will also try to calm the nerves of the market by by probably are, are, are talking in terms of uh, why it is required and how they are going to 
uh, uh, take care of overall economic health as well while focusing on inflation and, and the various other issues that we are grappling with. Uh, broadly, uh, we, I would say that uh, while interest rate hikes will continue, maybe the pace or the frequency could go down a bit, uh, at least in the immediate term. So at a sector level, how should approach the how should investors approach the uh, banking sector stocks? Is it time to uh, buy after the recent uh, correction that we have seen, or uh, better to wait out wait uh, out the uh, certain phase? Well, globally, banking sector seems to be under a bit of a challenge. But I would like to highlight here that uh, none of the Indian banks are uh, affected by what's happening in the globe. Uh, in fact, uh, we have just uh, uh, come out of a, a, a long asset quality cycle, wherein uh, most of the asset quality issues of Indian banks, both private sector as well as public sector, seem to have been taken care of. Uh, we have just started to see a bit of credit growth improvement in the uh, Indian context. Given all this, we are at a very, very uh, early stage of a new uh, credit cycle. Uh, very unlikely that you will have issues on credit quality at this point of time, either because of uh, events that are happening in the domestic market or because of the international factors. So to that extent, at Kotak Mutual Fund, we continue to believe that uh, banking will be one of the sectors which will probably uh, give you a much, much better earnings growth as compared to the overall market for the next two years. Yes, there is a section of the market which believes that the margins would come under some bit of a compression. But even if you account for that, uh, we believe that the earnings growth uh, will be uh, much better than the overall market average. And given that uh, this sector has not participated in recent times in the market performance, uh, we believe that valuations are also quite reasonable. And uh, long-term investors can definitely look at uh, this particular uh, uh, sector. So what's your broad view on the markets? Are valuations now in a comfortable zone? Yes, clearly, uh, while we are still at around 17,000 Nifty levels, uh, what we need to remember is uh, these were the levels which were there in the market uh, probably 18 to 20 months earlier as well. But at that point of time, it was uh, uh, probably towards 23 to 24 times one year forward, the price to earnings multiple. But at the same Nifty levels today, uh, see, having seen interim uh, growth in terms of corporate pro profitability for uh, uh, about six to seven quarters, the valuations are more uh, closer to pay range of valuation, something around uh, 17 and a half to 18 times one year forward multiple. Uh, which one cannot say that it is expensive. Neither one can cannot say that it is very, very attractive. It's, it's, I would say it is probably around the fair levels. So to that extent, while one cannot rule out further volatility in the markets, but any investor who is uh, entering markets today uh, for, a, for a, uh, a three to five year perspective uh, is expected to make uh, reasonable uh, returns from it. So what sectors are on your investment radar, uh, Harsha? And what, which ones are the uh, are complete avoids? Puni, clearly, uh, domestic businesses seem to be in a much better shape as compared to some of the export-oriented or global-facing businesses. The reason is very simple. Uh, domestic growth is much more resilient than global growth at this point of time. There are uh, more challenges to global growth and, and demand as compared to domestic uh, 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 economy or domestic demand. Uh, in, in that context, we have been uh, uh, preferring some of the domestic businesses uh, in our portfolio as compared to uh, global businesses. So sectors such as uh, banking, auto, cement, industrials, uh, these are some of the sectors where we have a positive view on. And we believe that um, as domestic economy continues to remain resilient and continues to improve from these levels as we go forward, uh, these are the sectors where there could be a reasonable improvement in terms of uh, earnings growth as well as uh, in terms of uh, possibility of free rating. So all in all, uh, these domestic facing sectors are some of the preferred sectors uh, at Kotak Mutual Fund at this point. Thank you, Harsha, for your time today. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. In Pakistan, it is illegal for a public official to keep anything without reporting it to the Tosha Khana. In August 2022, members of the ruling coalition alleged that former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan had not disclosed to the Tosha Khana information about gifts given to him and the proceeds from their alleged sale. So what is Tosha Khana and this case against Imran Khan? Anand Anara and Dhanbalan brings you the answer.
Islamabad police on Wednesday clashed with protesters in Zaman Park, Lahore, as they attempted to arrest former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan. Dozens of people and 30 officers, including the Islamabad DIG, were injured. A day later, the Lahore High Court ordered the police to seize all activity in Zaman Park till 10 a.m. Officers pulled back and Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, or PTI, celebrated in front of Khan's residence. So why was the police coming to arrest Khan? The Islamabad police was serving a non-bailable arrest warrant against Khan issued by the Sessions Court in Islamabad as he was absent from a hearing on the Tosha Khana reference case. The court ordered the police to present Khan in court on 18th of March. The Tosha Khana is a Pakistani government department under the cabinet division that holds expensive gifts given to public officials by other dignitaries. It is illegal for a public official to keep anything without reporting it to the Tosha Khana. Pakistan has now banned officials from receiving gifts valued over $300. In August 2022, members of the ruling coalition alleged that Imran Khan had not disclosed information to the Tosha Khana about gifts given and the proceeds from their supposedly illegal sale. The charge was brought to the speaker who referred it to the ECP. The ECP discovered that Khan had retained dozens of items and had sold four watches without disclosing them, allegedly earning $36 million. In October 2022, the ECP ruled that Khan would be disqualified from the National Assembly and barred from contesting the elections for five years. Khan challenged the decision in the Islamabad High Court. The ECP also referred him for criminal proceedings, which led to his arrest warrant. The Dawn reported that Tosha Khana freebies were fair game for everyone and that this was endemic in the political and bureaucratic leadership in Pakistan. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, I the bank of to every Indian. Even as Prime Minister or President of Pakistan can keep gifts that cost less than 30,000 Pakistani rupees, the more expensive gifts must be kept in the Tosha Khana under Pakistani law. That's all for today. Catch the next episode of The Morning Show tomorrow. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.